yeah, so before I, I forget, I want to thank my, um, my funders. Um, I want to thank my, my closest collaborators on, on these topics. So Anna Vildas, who's here in the audience, Johanna Gammal and Johanna Norco. Um, and of course, I want to thank uh, for the invitation to come and talk about these things. I, I really work on, um, not so much actually on, on dead zones. I'm, I think dead zones are kind of boring. What I'm really interested in is what those dead zones do to all the biodiversity down there. Um, and, and because the, 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 um, the hypoxic areas and the anoxic areas we do get, they tend to be very common all, along the seafloor. Um, I will talk mostly about benthic organisms on the seafloor as well. And I'm particularly interested to know um, what those benthic organisms actually do. Why does it matter that we have that biodiversity? And how do they respond uh, to increasing hypoxia? What are the implications of that? So rather than talk about broad-scale ecosystem impacts, I will focus on, on benthic organisms and, and, and related issues. So you've already seen this, um, this um, of, of figure. Um, it is clear that, that you know, this issue of deoxygenation is getting a lot of, a lot of uh, interest, uh, not at least because of the paper that, that already is, is becoming famous that came out last year about how, how oxygen is really a big problem for, for not only for nature and biodiversity, but for society that, that depends on biodiversity, for example. And as we already saw previously, um, it, 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 there's kind of major implications uh, when you kind of increase um, or decrease the, the oxygen levels, moving on from normoxia to hypoxia and anoxia. And so, as, as Denise already showed, the same graph, basically you can have a kind of a stimulation of how much energy that moves on to mobile predators, and that is because you get an enrichment effect early on. But then when you move, move down into maybe mild seasonal hypoxia to severe seasonal and persistent hypoxia, you're basic, basically kind of transforming the entire energy system into you know, how much energy goes to the microbes. I won't talk about microbes, and I won't talk about fish. And I'm really happy that Denise provided such a nice kind of overview on some of the fish issues as well. So the question is how this is affecting functioning. It's easy to talk and say that you know, energy goes here and there, but when you talk about the biodiversity, it quickly gets a bit complex. And, um, and I think um, what has really interested me is to kind of try and understand what is happening in, in terms of the functionality of the system. It's clear that hypoxia is a global stressor. Uh, it is reducing the biovolume for the higher order um, kind of organisms that can be there. So, we can think about how it's basically contracting the habitats that are available to, to all this kind of um, higher order, higher level kind of biodiversity of microorganisms, etc. You can view it as a spatio-temporal mosaic of disturbance. So it varies in time and space. And uh, although biodiversity effects are, are quite well documented, um, the functional consequences are often quite hard to interpret. And it's often because it's so hard to work with those seafloor communities and actually getting a kind of an in insight, especially if we talk about the natural communities out on the field. The reason, and, and especially on coastal environments, of course, why the seafloors are so important is because the benthic pelagic coupling is so tight. So it's the, the seafloor is very reactive to, um, to kind of changes in the pelagic realm. And, and so increases in productivity are, are quickly seen um, also down at the seafloor. And, and, and the question that I'm mostly kind of addressing here is, is to what level can organisms cope with these changes of increasing organic enrichment, um, increasing hypoxia, and how is that related then to the functioning of the system? There's this paper by Vacuer, Sunier, and Duarte, I don't know if I pronounced that right, um, that kind of highlights the issue that, that actually the fauna might be much more sensitive um, to low oxygen levels than previous, previously thought. So what these guys did, um, they were kind of looking at the thresholds of hypoxia um, and, and responses of organisms, and what they found was that when they I think it was, yeah, well, nearly, 200, nearly 300 organisms um, that range from all kind of different types of phyla. And they actually saw that when you kind of already at 4.6 milligrams per liter of oxygen, 
actually you've lost 10% of the most sensitive species. And that not, might not seem like a lot, but it is. It is substantial. But maybe the most interesting point here is that following that kind of um, level, you have a very rapid decrease in, 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 or increased uh, mortality in a lot of the organisms. So this is the median lethal concentration. And um, so really, we, when we talk about hypoxia, we often talk about two milligrams per liter or whatever. Uh, but the point is that the biota, the biodiversity, is actually responding um, much more earlier. Sorry, I just need to get some water. So if we think about the benthic organisms, we haven't really moved on much uh, beyond uh, what uh, this famous paper by Tom Pearson and Rutger Rosenberg, that in, in the late 80s, 70s, kind of created this generic successional model that kind of described the response of the benthic communities to increasing organic enrichment. And basically, well, this was something that was developed for fjord systems that had limited water exchange. And, uh, and basically, they kind of described changes in how species uh, abundance and biomass of, of benthic macroorganisms change along a disturbance gradient of, of, of increasing organic enrichment. Of course, associated with this, this organic enrichment, you typically also have uh, reduced conditions develop, um, as we can see in these um, SPI photos up here. So basically, a lot of the deep burrowing fauna is lost along the way, and at the end of the day, you get these um, this microbial communities dominating. But the major point here is that we lose the deep burrowing organisms that, that might be quite important. This model, um, a lot of work has been um, kind of subsequent to this paper, um, has, has been addressed and people have kind of inferred functional um, changes along this gradient uh, through, for example, traits analysis, etc. But actually the quantification of, of kind of ecosystem functions and how they change um, is, 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 is a bit hard to do. And we've tried to kind of make the point that, that we really need to address how these organisms, what they do in the sediment, because they might be so important for, for biogeochemical cycling. And nevertheless, it's so complex with, to include this biodiversity that we rarely actually have biodiversity included in, 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 in different models that try to predict, um, predict kind of biogeochemical cycling um, in relation to hypoxia or in the future, et cetera. Nevertheless, especially in, in, in shallow areas, um, the organisms will be really important for the overall picture. And, and I think they will be critical for understanding kind of what's, what's happening. There's this nice paper um, by, by um, <clears throat> Rutger Rosenberg and also Carl Norling, who um, looked at the Gulmar Fjord on the Swedish west coast where they looked at, at the degradation and recovery pathways um, kind of when hypoxia uh, hypoxia started and then in a recovery phase following that, and they used the kind of the natural gradients in the Gulmar Fjord with increasing depth to basically look at what was happening uh, structurally with the uh, benthic communities in the system. And the right hand side here, we basically have a multivariate description of benthic communities. So this is accounting for the different species and their abundances. And, and in multivariate space, we can see that the, the really shallow communities that are up here at 75 meters, um, over time, they don't change that much. They, they keep clustered together. But then with increasing hypoxia, we, uh, they deviate more and more, basically, from that kind of undisturbed community because of hypoxia. The interesting thing with this is that the degradation pathway and the recovery pathway are completely different. And, 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 and so actually knowing what's going on and when you just go out and sample once of the seafloor, it's good to know sometimes whether you, you've, what you're seeing is, is a consequence or, a, or like at the, what point of the disturbance event um, things are, are happening. And so with Rutka, we looked at this data set that they, they had and uh, we looked at the same gradient, and, 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 and what we kind of saw is that um, if we just look at the degradation, we can see a monotonic, basically, degradation uh, kind of with increasing depth. But then following the disturbance and the legacy of, of hypoxic disturbance, what the point is is that there might be increasing amounts of resources made available 
to the uh, organisms that come afterwards. So basically, if you look at, there, there are these opportunistic species that are really efficient at, at transforming um, organic matter and, and making use of all this, all this resource that is, is there. And, and they increase ex dramatically when, 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 when you have a kind of a past legacy of, of disturbance. So this really has important implications for her, how this organic matter is then transformed and, and how we can kind of um, understand the system. And so when we try to understand biodiversity, it really is complex because all the different places that we sample or we look at the Swedish coast or we look at the Finnish coast or Polish coast or whatever, they're all very different. And the, the biodiversity that is associated with these places is also different. And, and, and so we ecologists have a huge challenge in terms of trying to kind of translate the information that we, we often work at these small scales. We work in, in, in um, mesocosms or we work in the field and um, patches, etc. But, but really, to make ourselves relevant to society, we need to get an understanding at the large scales. And, and so what I'll be talking about here is to kind of combining different kind of methods and different approaches to try and understand the same problem, and that is, how does biodiversity matter, and how can, you, how can we generalize across space and time? And we do this for a reason, and that's because increasingly people are talking about how amazingly important the ecosystem services are. And that's what we people kind of take home from nature and from biodiversity. But my point with this figure is just that it's incredibly complex when we start kind of translating processes to functions and services. And, and so, yeah, it's all a bit daunting, really. Moving into the Baltic, we often talk about how desperately bad it is, and it is really, really bad. Uh, but most of the time, we, look, we, we, we move in the, around in the Baltic in summer when we have these algal blooms. But if we go diving in October, November, December, it can look like this. And it's stunningly beautiful. And I think we should remember that as well when we talk about the problems. But the point is, as you can see from this picture, we might have open sandy bottoms, we might have seagrass beds, we can have different types of phocoids, etc. But they're really complex and they're really kind of um, complicated to understand in a, in a larger perspective. But nevertheless, even these beautiful places are, of course, as we know, they're um, affected by eutrophication and the associated hypoxia. And it really is, among all, I mean, if we think about the biodiversity, everything else is paling in comparison to um, the effects of eutrophication. I did my PhD in the, uh, in the mid 90s, late 90s, and um, with Eric Bunsdorf, we actually looked at these accumulations of, of, of drifting macroalgae. Um, I thought I did good progress then to kind of try and understand what was, you know, the effects of these macroalgae on the seafloor, but we still haven't advanced that much. We still don't know how common these macroalgal mats are on the seafloor. We know that they can cover tens of hectares or hundreds of square kilometers even, but nobody's looking into them. The point is that we were monitoring for oxygen. Uh, we're taking water samples above these algal mats, and it might be just really good oxygen conditions. Nevertheless, the biodiversity that's sitting on the seafloor um, is affected, of course. Here we can see really nice bacterial. Oh, I've got a bit of microbes here. So some big et etc. So as Jakob pointed out, um, the Baltic is really a, a, one of the prime examples on the uh, hypoxic problem. And we know it's really widespread and, and more or less permanent at the central. And then we have in the central Baltic, and then we have kind of seasonal hypoxia along the coast. And, um, but the point is that, that all that um, hypoxia is having a major influence on biodiversity. And with Anna Vilnius, we did this work for Helcom, uh, where we tried to kind of define reference conditions for biodiversity across um, the entire Baltic Sea. We used all the monitoring data that was available at that time. And we tried to define kind of gamma diversity for the different bases of the Baltic. And we came up with this figure that was kind of saying how many average, the average number of species moving up from the Baltian Bay, this is in the open Baltic, um, all the way down to, to Danish waters. And we can see that it's a very strong gradient in biodiversity. 
The point with this figure is that we also defined kind of a good moderate border that we had to do, and then we also did, uh, did a status assessment. And the point, point is that we're way below the good moderate border throughout the Baltic, more or less, and it's all because of hypoxia, more or less. So moving on then to kind of investigate some of that hypoxia and looking at the hypoxic gradients, etc., we've done a, 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 a number of of a um, number of papers of experiments that have kind of tried to kind of resolve some of the links between biodiversity and, 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 and nutrient fluxes and how they might change um, along hypoxic gradients. And just to provide you one of the examples, um, this was a, 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 a kind of study where we, we, we crossed the entire Baltic looking at hypoxic gradients in coastal areas. Um, and uh, what we wanted to do here was to basically link different descriptors of biodiversity um, and environmental factors on ecosystem functioning. Now, by ecosystem functioning, um, that is basically more or less described by um, inorganic nutrient fluxes that we combined statistically into a combined metric. Um, and we talked about, well, basically a, 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 a description of, of multifunctionality. Now, what we found was that seafloor biodiversity out there really does matter, even in hypoxic conditions. So here's the area that we kind of um, addressed, and we, we looked at the hypoxic gradients in the, in the, uh, in the pro Baltic proper. And, and what we found that when we looked at good oxygen conditions, and I'll come into the definition of that very soon, the four most common taxa, we don't have that many species out there, but basically they could, they could explain, statistically explain a lot of the variance in the nutrient fluxes um, that we could see when we incubated cores. Uh, we also saw that abundance, um, so how many of those worms or, or mussels were there really mattered, and who was there also really mattered. Um, in poor oxygen, perhaps a bit surprisingly, but I do talk about you know, kind of a safe limit. It's not a safe limit, but I talk about kind of this upper limit of, of when you might start expecting to see an effect. We saw that some species still could explain a lot of the, uh, a lot of the variants. And, and these were large bioturbating taxa that basically uh, can cope with these um, lower um, oxygen conditions and affect uh, nutrient cycling. This particular uh, organism, Marincelleria, is actually three different species that, that have invaded the Baltic from elsewhere. Um, and it's been changing the biodiversity that we have there, both in terms of the structure, but also then in terms of the, uh, the functionality of the system. And so it's basically established all around the Baltic. And, and what's special with it is that it can tolerate um, somewhat lower um, oxygen conditions. What we found when we uh, worked on those cruises was that, that basically, depending on how many uh, worms you had at 10 centimeters depth, we found that they really increased sediment water content. They increased, and they increased the total pigments with increasing amounts, uh, with increasing um, uh, worms in the system. And so there's an indication that these organisms are shuttling a lot of the pigments, a lot of the organic matter production um, down to depth. And, and so with the group of scientists in the Hyper Project, um, there was kind of this, this kind of idea, well, this is kind of an interesting observation because you know, they're clearly doing something. Um, first of all, they're burrowing really deep and they might be shuttling all this organic matter down, but they're also oxygenating the seafloor. And, and, Especially here in the Stockholm archipelago, there happened to be data that suggested that, that large increases in Marantzileria kind of coincided with improved um, nearby oxygen conditions. And the question was why? Well, my smart colleagues, they did this reactive transport model, um, looking basically at a the different phosphorus kind of species or, or um, yeah, and, 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 and basically um, if looking over a kind of a longer time scale, where you first have marine solaria in the picture or absent and then have them present, over time they actually uh, might be able to bind phosphate um, at quite some, some astonishing level. And this is because what they're doing is that they're oxygenating the seafloor. So they're creating kind of the possibility for phosphorus to get bound uh, down. 
Now, a back of the envelope calculation suggested that this um, ecosystem service that these worms might be providing might be larger than the total external uh, phosphorus loading of the Stockholm area. Excuse me. Now, for this to happen, it really has to have the right conditions and you have to have the right biogeochemistry in the seafloor. So it might not be that simple, but I think it provides a nice illustration that these, that biodiversity might, might have an influence in different ways. Of course, they might also contribute to release a lot of uh, toxic substances that have been buried away because they burrow so deep, right? So combining with these kind of field-based studies where we're trying to understand how biodiversity matters, we then move on to kind of build more mechanistic insight. And it's, for me as a field biologist, I really need to get down there and see what's happening. So I don't know how many hours I spent diving and doing experiments, but it's been really a useful way of trying to understand what's happening in situ. So what we've done is that we've manipulated biodiversity at different levels. Here's kind of following a hypoxia of how all these big bivalves have come up to the surface, and, and we've tried to understand um, um, what's going on. So in a number of studies, we've done this, and uh, this was also part of Anna Vilnes PhD work in the Hyper Project, um, where we did all this manipulation, and basically, um, we, we, we're contrasting kind of control communities with different levels of disturbed communities. And there's one particular example where we were looking at the, at the frequency of disturbance, basically short-term disturbance events, and how they were kind of contributing to then degrading uh, the biodiversity. And then we looked at functionality associated with that. And so we had a press disturbance that was continuing all the time. That was about a month. And then we had a pulse disturbance, a recovery phase, et cetera, at different levels of intensity and a control community that, that was undisturbed. Basically with the idea that we want to try and understand um, how the frequency of, of disturbance of hypoxic stress is affecting the system. Without going into much detail, we measured a lot of different um, kind of ecosystem functions or had proxies for them. And, and the overall point was that when we looked at them in, in isolation, uh, it was not until the end of the very strong disturbance that you started seeing these really negative effects. But when you looked at them from a multifunctionality perspective and you combined them into one metric, then we actually start to see uh, responses much earlier. Um, and, and we see that, that, um, that the, the functionality is really vulnerable after only a few disturbances of a couple of days. So again, the system is much more sensitive than we think. I'm coming towards the end here. Um, then finally, one of the things that happens, of course, when, you do it, when, when, when these benthic communities collapse, is that you, you can have different phases of recovery. But if that phase of recovery is interrupted too soon, then you can never build mature communities that are diverse. And one of the major effects here is that we lose these big bivalves, for example, that are very important in the Baltic, and we don't even appreciate because they live there buried in the sands. And uh, what happens with them is that they might live for 10 to 20 years even. And so if we have a recurring disturbances that come back seasonally, we can never build these mature kind of parts of the population that really, really matter to functionality. So size really matters. It was the, most, the strongest predictor of, of the fluxes we were looking at. And, um, and, and it has really severe um, uh, kind of consequences because recovery may take decades. And that's why even seasonal hypoxia is really serious. Now to finish off with, I just want to kind of highlight some new work, um, and this is by Elina Virtanen, a PhD student who's sitting here and knows everything about this. Um, but it's about predicting coastal hypoxia then, because if we have such a problem, even with seasonal hypoxia, it becomes really important that we can predict where it occurs. And if we think about this is where I work uh, most of the time at Tarmine um, Sological Station um, in Finland, we have a very complex archipelago, and the topographical complexity is immense. And we can't sample everywhere to understand what's going on. And if we then look at um, the frequency of, again, it's, it's not such a severe level, but 
just for illustration, again, that 4.6 milligram per liter, we can see that it occurs at least once a year at quite a few of these monitoring stations. And we can see that, well, it's a, it's a reasonable monitoring kind of system, but it, but it by far, well, it doesn't cover all these areas. But when we then use a topographical, or Elena uses a topographical um, kind of terrain model to basically try and predict where you have, um, you know, where you might have these hypoxic areas because you don't have so much water exchange, um, then actually, you know, when you compare this model with, with, um, uh, with the actual kind of sample data, um, um, the relationship is really good. And the point here is that we do need to recognize that when we talk about these hypoxic areas, we're talking about the seascapes of death, right? We're talking about big areas that, that might fundamentally transform not only biodiversity, but the functionality of the system. And so, especially given that, I mean, people have talked about how temperatures have been increasing. Uh, Christoph and colleagues, and, 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 and also together with Martin, um, did, a, did some work in, in the Twanaman area, and we also started summarizing some of the long-term monitoring data from Twanaman. So this is at 30 meters depth just outside. We can again see this radical increase in temperature over the past couple of decades. It really is a tremendous increase in temperature. And to add, I mean, the Storfjärden, where, this, uh, where these samples have been taken, is a really well-mixed environment. You know, there's lots of dynamic, and it's really hard to model. So my colleagues in Stockholm find it hard to model because it's so dynamic. When we then look at this, um, this last summer, we actually had the warmest rec temperatures ever recorded at, 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 at 30 meters depth. We had over 20 degrees at 30 meters depth. And, and we had mass mortalities in the shallows that we couldn't really quantify because we didn't really have the monitoring to kind of revisit the thing. But we were seeing um, temperature kind of effects that are really amazing. I'm not showing it here because I couldn't find the data, but basically over the same time period, we have really, really low oxygen levels, or kind of down to two milligrams per liter at, at occasions. So we need to move up in scale, and we need to understand what's happening at, at not only the cores that we work in or, or, or such, and, and we're currently working on, on trying to understand what we call the breathing seascape. And so with colleagues from Denmark, Ronnie Glud and Carla Tard and others, um, we're kind of employing this edicovariance techniques, which has the benefit that it can integrate the oxygen dynamics across entire habitats. So you can talk about 100 square meter kind of breathing seascapes. And um, this has proved to be very promising. And what we can do, what is fun with this technique is that it's not, it's non-invasive and we can compare actually hard substrate with soft substrates and we can get an overall picture of what's going on in the, in the seascapes um, and their associated biodiversity. And we can quantify um, um, the productivity, the, the gross primary production, the respiration and net ecosystem metabolism. And of course the idea is that if you kind of move down a eutrophication gradient, um, the amplitude of this uh, respiration uh, will change. And so it's a kind of a way of, of, of making head, some headway into to understanding the seascapes. And, and more recently, this is some paper that Christoph is now preparing. Uh, this was from a cruise we did in the Twarman area, and actually using, um, what is it called, the Vegas laser cavity, whatever. Um, and, and, um, and to actually look at the, um, the surface concentrations of methane um, and, and what we're working on now is trying to, also with, with Martin Jakobson, is to kind of try the, uh, to understand the link between the, the benthic habitat diversity and the diversity of benthic habitats and how they might relate to these fluxes. Um, and in this one, uh, which is um, from an echosounder, a spiffy echosounder, I think it's Christian Strane's uh, picture, where you can see actually flares of, of methane um, kind of emerging from the sediment in, 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 in late summer. So it's kind of all of this is, of course, related. So it's not only about oxygen deficiency, it's about increasing temperatures, it's about multiple stressors. All of these are affecting the biodiversity and they're affecting how the ecosystem is breathing. And um, it has really kind of interesting implications. So to conclude, I think 
a very important point is that already moderate levels of uh, hypoxia can have a severe effect on biodiversity. And, and we shouldn't look at the very severe levels to kind of think that, you know, that is when the effects take place. It, it, the more we work on it, the, more, the, the clearer it is that, that macrofauna really has an influence in organic matter transformation and nutrient recycling. Uh, but it really matters who's there. It's not necessarily about species diversity. It might be about specific traits um, or um, specific types of individuals that are there doing important things, like the big bivalves. And like with the big bivalves, um, again, the point is that if we have these disturbances by hypoxia too often, we never have the mature individuals develop. And it has a fundamental implication for how the system works. We do need to compare studies from different types of systems. So we've been looking at coastal Baltic, we've been looking at open sea Baltic, we've been looking at west coast Sweden, more marine, coastal, etc., combined with experiments, etc., to kind of um, improve generality of our findings. And I think the field studies really are important. I'm, I love field studies, um, but, it, but you have to deal with, with all this complexity, of course. But, but we should bother go outside and we should bother actually looking at what's going on. And I think we really have to have multiple approaches. So, and I think we need to employ new techniques to kind of get a better picture of what's going on. Um, so yeah, with that, I want to thank you.